Do you remember the time when you found out about what was going on? When you couldn't move one day in dance class. And people would ask me, like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just tired. I remember I asked, well, why can't you dance? And you showed me... Bruises. Bruises. You revealed to me that there was some trouble at home. You know, I tried to do everything that I was supposed to do as a teacher, which I had to report. And I did it anonymously, of course, but it was maybe days after that when you called me to tell me that you were running away. My husband, he had ran away when he was your age, exactly. And he was taken in by his choir teacher. I remember you said, you know, I don't care about my job. You just wanted to help me. So you stayed with me a couple of times when you just didn't have a place to go or we needed to go pick you up. And I remember when you spent Thanksgiving with my family, I taught you how to make a pumpkin pie. That was a really special Thanksgiving because I had my immediate family, my husband, and my children, my grandmother, and you were there. I had everybody there that I truly loved. Well, I, for a long time in my life, didn't have that experience, even call somebody a mom. But just to see the way you took care of me, that's how mom should act. And I just feel like there's no way for me to thank you for everything. You showed me that I'm not alone, that I actually have somebody. I think what you don't realize is that you helped me too. You have taught me a lot about being a teacher, but you've also taught me a lot about being a parent. Just the other day, someone said, is that your son? And I said, yes. You always have a family here. You always will. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Um, If you haven't already, please feel free to take your seats. Um, I'm happy to hand over um, the next session to Dr. DeConis, CEO and President of Northwest uh, Permanente, who will introduce herself and Dr. Murthy. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the privilege of bringing us back right after lunch, yay. But no worries, uh, this will be a group effort, and uh, just as the childhood uh, trauma experiences is a village, it takes a village, and this conversation will be such as well. Um, So my name is Imelda Deconis, and I am an internist by training. Before taking on this role as the CEO and President of Northwest Permanente, in Northwest Permanente, we are the largest independent multi-specialty group in Oregon. And I'm happy to say we are the first medical group in the world that has been certified as a B Corporation. And certainly, most importantly, we proudly serve and care for the members of KP Northwest in Oregon and Southern Washington. You know, when you think about Kaiser Permanente, we pride ourselves in leading in prevention, in Thrive, and population health. And our biggest opportunity, one of our biggest opportunities still, is in addressing, partnering broadly, deeply with communities, businesses, lawmakers, and policymakers in addressing adverse childhood experiences which I agree with our former president of American Academy of Pediatrics in saying that this is the largest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. How many of you, if I were to tell you that one in five of us in this room have our life expectancy cut by as many as 20 years, would do something? What would it take us, for us, to act? Nearly one in five children in Oregon, 18%, suffer with, live with four or more adverse life experiences. And based on the studies and that we know, this alone, we know four times at risk these children are for suffering and living with depression for the rest of their lives. They are eight times more likely to become alcoholics 
20 times more likely to abuse IV drugs. And as for their life expectancy, as many as 20 years shorter, cut short by diabetes, heart attacks, cancer, all because of the burden from adverse childhood experiences. So this is our conversation this afternoon around the federal perspective and more. And I am so thrilled to be part of you today, part of this conversation, and certainly honored to be joined by Dr. Vivek Murthy, our 19th Surgeon General of the United States. And you know, during his tenure, some of us think it was too short, um, he tackled, he called us to act on the opioid crisis. Remember Ebola, Zika, Flint water, few of the crises that he and his team tackled. And I must confess that when I look at his long, long list of accomplishments and impressive credentials, mango aficionado <laughs> is one that has, uh, yeah, has me curious. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Murthy, for joining us today. So I will not define what a moderator does today, but again, this is a, a conversation. And while you are thinking of your questions for Dr. Murthy or myself, I'm going to start us off with um, Dr. Murthy. As we're, you're an internist, I'm an internist, and we see the complex adult patients that, when we really look at their history are the victims of, uh, and the outcomes really, of ad adverse childhood experiences. So we get that moving upstream is critical if we're ever, ever going to make a dent in improving people's lives, never mind bending the cost curve of healthcare in, in this country. So knowing all that, what, what is the role of the federal government in this effort, in this adverse childhood experiences? Well, let me just say first how wonderful it is to be here with all of you. It is so good to know that you are coming together to address an issue I think that is so fundamentally important, not just to the health and well-being of our community and our country, but it's important to our to answering the question of do, does the way our institutions run, do, do the way our policies, um, you know, you know, should turn out, are they reflective of the deeper values that we have uh, as a country? And I think that if you look at the gap that we have between how some of our children are raised and some of the, you know, those who are the worst off are raised. If you look at the disparate health outcomes that so many of them are, are facing both during childhood and later in life, you see that there is a gap that reflects not just a health gap but a value gap that we have to close. So it is so nice to know that people like you are coming together to think more deeply about this issue. I think it's uh, certainly appropriate that we are here at a Kaiser facility given that the role that you played uh, as an institution uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, in the foundational ACEs study. And I will say that this room in particular uh, is meaningful to me because when I started my tenure as Surgeon General, one of the first reports that I issued was a report on walking and walkable communities. And we launched that report right here in this room. I was standing right here on this stage at this podium. Uh, and uh, it was a, a wonderful way to sort of begin my tenure and to kick off a partnership with Kaiser that has certainly uh, lasted a long time. So it's so truly wonderful to be here. <clears throat> you know, while, you know, when I think about the, how we're going to address this larger issue of trauma, you know, among children, uh, I think the federal government certainly has a role that it, it needs to play. And it already is playing somewhat of a role. Many of you are likely familiar with the grants that SAMHSA issues, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, funded in part by, uh, by a, a piece of legislation that was passed in 2000, which has provided funding uh, for a series of programs that both increase public awareness of childhood trauma, that help provide training uh, to uh, clinicians uh, around how to handle and address childhood trauma, and that also fund uh, treatment efforts in communities. And as a result of that program alone, uh, there have been over 200,000 uh, people who have been trained 
uh, through uh, the, the city SAMHSA grants. And there have been over 40,000 children who have received treatment as a result of these grants. In the Administration for Children and Families, which is a, divi a division within the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Child Health Bureau has also uh, been funding efforts to address uh, child abuse and neglect, uh, which have been very important. And then even if you look outside strictly of programs that have trauma, like in their, in their titles, we know that CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, has been really important in providing kids health insurance coverage, which is absolutely essential uh, if we want to address not just trauma, but a whole range uh, of adversities that children are facing. But there is a problem, I think, in how we have addressed this from a federal perspective, which is that the approach, I think, that historically has been taken on the federal side has been very well-intentioned, uh, but often very fragmented. And part of what we need is real collaboration across agencies and across departments to pull together a concrete target and strategy for how to address and reduce childhood trauma. Because the truth is, it's not just the job of the Department of Health and Human Services. We know that housing plays an important role in the health and the upbringing of children. We know that what happens in, in schools, uh, as we've talked about earlier this morning, has a powerful impact on whether or not trauma is recognized and then later addressed. Um, so it's not just HHS, but we need efforts that pull together housing and urban development, the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, as well as the Department of Justice, and in particular the Bureau of Prisons, uh, given how many children are struggling with parents who are incarcerated uh, without their ability to see them or communicate with them or build relationships with them in a meaningful way. Now, is the question is, is this a pipe dream or is it possible to have this kind of interagency co collaboration? Well, it is possible, and there's actually quite a bit of precedent for it. Uh, one of those efforts is one that I was very involved with, which is an interagency effort around tobacco. So we recognize, for example, it was essential to think about tobacco not just as a issue that had to be dealt with in clinics and in hospitals, but to really think about how housing impacts uh, smoking, about how what happens in schools impacts smoking. And so the interagency efforts around tobacco have been very productive and have led uh, to some really tangible concrete initiatives, which I think are actually saving lives. But we need an initiative like that, a collaboration like that when it comes to childhood trauma, because right now, while we have a you know, we have really good, well-intentioned and smart people in government, there are a lot of people who have levers that can be used to address trauma who don't recognize that. Uh, if you go to the Department of Housing and Urban Development and you ask them, is childhood trauma uh, part of you know, your responsibility to address? Is it one of your charges? You may get blank stares, uh, you know, other than from uh, perhaps a few people who will connect the dots. But that is a purpose of interagency efforts. It's to connect the dots and to accelerate efforts, especially efforts that have diverse root causes. So that's a place where I think we would need to, we need to see the federal government go. Uh, I'll say one last thing on this point, which is that in 2010, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, there was a little known section of that law which funded uh, something called the Prevention and Public Health Fund. And that fund also uh, pulled together or assembled the National Prevention Council, which was a council that was charged with developing a prevention strategy for the country. Now, as a nation, we've actually never had a comprehensive prevention strategy from the federal government. Mm -hmm. But that was a charge of the National Prevention Council. And very importantly, the people who were put onto the National Prevention Council were the secretaries and administrators of, of all the major federal agencies. So they included defense and housing, urban development, and interior. And it was, because, it was based on the recognition that if we really want to build a prevention-based society, it's going to require all of these efforts. It's going to require us to think about how we design communities, how we design housing, uh, how we you know, design our schools and support our schools. It's going to require all of this. And for a number of years, the National Prevention Council was um, a positive force in crafting a national prevention strategy, which uh, we issued and then later revised. Uh, and in also bringing departments together to start identifying ways in which they could advance prevention. So one of the collaborations that I had when I was in the administration, and I, the Surgeon General chairs the National Prevention Council, which is why I was privileged to engage with it uh, so deeply. But we work closely with the Ho Department of Housing and Urban Development, with Secretary Julian Castro, uh, to put in place uh, rules to restrict smoking in public housing, recognizing that m for so many children, 
uh, it was in their homes, in public housing, that they were exposed to secondhand smoke. And the racial disparities there were extraordinary. Uh, and so this was an important first step that was taken, but it was based on a recognition that housing, develop, housing and urban development had a public health role to play. And I don't know what exactly is happening with the National Prevention Council now. There are a number of initiatives that we had over the last few years which uh, you know, are either under review or in some cases being continued, in some cases have been discontinued. My hope is that the efforts of the National Prevention Council will be not only supported uh, but actually accelerated because I think that kind of interagency collaborative work to address core health issues like trauma is more important now than ever before. Agree. Agree. Um, Anyone with questions, please, as before, go to the mic. But I just wanted to follow up what, what you said, Dr. Murthy, on interagency efforts. Um, you know, as I look at the policy landscape, you know, we human beings love our silos, uh, you know, what we call the cylinders of excellence, right? And uh, <laughs> many speakers already this morning have alluded to the fact that we've got siloed policies, siloed budgets, budgets. So... Who is the convener? Who's the catalyst? What is that thing that's going to drive the interagency collaboration, particularly in addressing? Because you and I know, as we look at the landscape, healthcare, education, prisons, corrections, crime, doesn't it all just go back to what we've been talking about all day, which is this where do we begin to connect, collaborate, and create? resilient families, individuals with equanimity. I mean, that we're all treating as opposed to preventing. Who, who is that catalyst that's going to promote this ongoing interagency collaboration to tackle ACES? Well, if you're specifically talking about within government, who's going to do this? A single department typically can't orchestrate that entirely on their own. Uh, what it usually requires, if it's truly going to be interagency, is it requires uh, leadership and initiative from the White House to say, okay, this is an issue that we think is a priority, and so we are going to mandate that all departments participate in building and executing a collective strategy to address this issue. Um, that was something that President Obama during his time did around opioids. Uh, other presidents have done it around other issues that have been important to them. There is a role also that Congress can play here uh, as well uh, if it creates a requirement uh, to form an interagency uh, task force with a specific deliverable. But this, is, this requires... This requires leadership from a very high level uh, to not only be instituted, but then to continually have accountability uh, so that it doesn't just become a, a committee that sits on a shelf. Uh, and the question is, like, how do you get that onto the radar you know, of the White House or you know, leadership in Congress? And it's not easy, right, because there are so many competing issues, and it feels uh, these days like there's so much noise. How do you – and you know, the press is interested in covering often – things that are salacious and that are, are you know, are, are fantastic and extreme and surprising. But it's sometimes these things which are not, you know, front page news that make the biggest difference in the lives of the people we love. So it's not easy, but I do think that one of the key things that we're going to have to do uh, as a country if we want to prioritize children is we have to build more public awareness and support for initiatives like that for the issue of trauma as a priority. And if you don't think that, that, that public support matters, you know, I would point you to the area of breast cancer research. Right? If you ask, you know, is breast cancer the, the issue that affects uh, and kills the most people you know, in the United States, the answer is no, it's not. Although it does affect millions and millions of people, uh, including many people all of us know and love. Uh, but what has been extraordinarily effective about advocacy in the breast cancer uh, community is that there has been a remarkably successful effort to build not just awareness but engagement mm -hmm. around the country from communities in funding breast cancer research and supporting treatment efforts. And so you will rarely see uh, members of Congress balk at allocating funds uh, toward breast cancer research. But if you went uh, you know, to, a member of Congress, to members of Congress today and said, you know, we want you to fund, uh, you know, efforts to address childhood trauma, you may get some hemming and hawing, you know, some agreement, yes, this is important, but not a whole lot of actual initiative. Uh, and that's because they're, they aren't hearing nearly as vocally from the public that this issue is important to me, uh, 
Uh, and this is an issue that I'm going to continue to speak up on, and this is an issue that we are, I'm going to pressure you on. Now, I want to cautious us, caution us about one thing, which is that if you walk down the logic uh, path I just laid out there, you can ask the question, well, there are many issues that are important. How are, are we going to be fighting over a fixed pie here? Mm -hmm. Because who's to say that uh, childhood trauma is more important than breast cancer research, is more important than colon cancer research, matters more than cardiovascular disease? Like, how do we actually figure this out? And that's where I think as a society where we have uh, perhaps erred a bit is in going far too downstream in thinking about how to, how to carve up the pie. We've thought, okay, we need a, a whole team and department and funding stream to deal with diabetes, another one to deal with cardiovascular disease. And in the same way, uh, Melda, that you were talking about moving upstream mm -hmm. and how that has struck uh, you and has struck me and many of us in our clinical practices, the importance of doing that, we have to also think about doing that from a policy and funding perspective. And so the question is, how do we fund upstream initiatives that will actually collectively reduce the likelihood of breast cancer and heart disease and substance use disorders? In 2016, when I issued the, the first Surgeon General's report on substance use and addiction, we dedicated a whole chapter to prevention, which is not typical, but we did that because we wanted to emphasize the importance of going upstream, and we wanted to profile specific programs, uh, like the uh, Nurse Family Partnership that Doug mentioned earlier today, uh, but we wanted to profile specific programs that were effective uh, in reducing substance use disorders. Now, the thing about many of these programs, uh, which is something that's not going to be a surprise to those of you in the room, is that these were not programs that went into schools and beat kids over the head and said, drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad. That's not how they actually ended up working. But many of these ended up being school, uh, programs that strengthened the emotional well-being of children. They enabled them to understand and process and regulate their emotions more effectively and to build connections more effectively with other people. And the downstream effects of that were seen not just in reduced rates of substance use disorders, but in reduced rates of alcohol use, tobacco use, increased graduation rates, re reduced teen pregnancies, reduced incarceration and, you know, and arrests, reduced episodes of violence, and on and on and on the, the list went. Now, in clinical medicine, uh, you know, I remember from my training that we would get really excited if a cardiology interventional trial came out and showed a half percent or one percent reduction uh, in, in the incidence of MIs, of, of heart attacks. But these interventions are having double-digit uh, effects mm -hmm. in terms of reductions in the outcomes that we care about, yet they don't get nearly the same amount of press you know, as a successful uh, clinical trial, and they certainly don't get the funding they deserve. What's going to change that ultimately, the only thing I believe that will change that, is not you know, simply having stories that are shocking, because unfortunately we have become immune to shocking stories. They seem to be a dime a dozen these days, which is tragic. But I think what is going to change that is growing public support that is not passive, but that actively demands that we invest upstream with accountability. Because this is a, a critical point to make. If you have funding with no accountability, then you will likely see no change and that funding will disappear because people say it doesn't matter, it didn't make a difference, right? And that, unfortunately, has been the history of many efforts at government funding, allocating billions of dollars, you know, to X project and then not really, you know, having accountability of the impact. I worry in some ways that that is what's happening part, at, at times with our opioid funding, mm -hmm. right? We are putting a significant amount of money uh, to, toward the opioid epidemic, not nearly enough, but we are putting billions of dollars to address it. But if we had a problem in any of our organizations, in one of your schools, in one of your hospital settings, in a nonprofit organization, as a leader, your job would be to identify the problem, to define what you needed to do to solve it, to set a timetable for resolving that, and then to also create a system of accountability. But if I were to ask you in the opioid epidemic, for example, um, what is, where are we supposed to be in a year? By what percentage are we supposed to reduce overdose deaths? or change prescriptions? Where are we supposed to be in five years? Um, are we all clear on what it is that we're supposed to do as a society to get to that singular goal? Uh, it's, mur it's murky. It's not entirely clear. And what I worry about is that if you do all the hard work of advocacy, pump money into an issue, and there's no accountability and nobody can show success at the end, that money goes away and it goes to the next issue. And that's a, a thing, uh, something we have to be careful about 
uh, as a community that's seeking to draw more attention to this issue, to get more funding for this issue, is that we have to have and demand that those accountability structures be in place as well. Great. And so what I'm hearing from you is an action item from today. Uh, if we truly believe that this needs to be addressed as a nation, how do we all in this room, how do we all in this room commit today as a takeaway action item of public service announcement, public awareness? I know many of you are engaged individually and in your organizations to really strengthen the education and awareness of our communities, but imagine the power of doing this together. I, I'd just like us to reimagine what that could look like if everybody in our organizations in this room got together and we organically created the task force to educate the nation on what ACES is, impact, imagine the power of that. So I'd, I'd like us to reimagine what that could look like because PSA, not prostate specific antigen, but public service <laughs> awareness, to your point, is what's gonna amplify, give stereo effect to what you and I have been talking about all day and we can keep screaming about this amongst ourselves, but until we have the public behind us I don't know that the Hill, I don't know that the White House is really going to understand what it is and what the impact is. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. No Let me just ask you one other point on that, Imelda, which is we, we talked a lot about what you have to do, what would be helpful in moving the federal government. But, you know, it's, it's especially important that we recognize that there are other places where action, helpful action can originate from other than the federal side, right? The state governments are often incredibly powerful, especially now, as, as you know, sources you know, of activity and, and, and funding. And you know, I think targeting state-based efforts is, uh, is exceedingly important. Uh, the same is true of local efforts. But even putting government entirely aside, you know, we're, when you think about insurance companies, right? This is, the world now for insurance companies is very different than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And there are more payers, uh, including Medicare, but private payers as well that are recognizing that in some way, shape, or form that they need to start engaging in more deeply in prevention efforts, and not clinical prevention, but in community prevention, that they need to start engaging more deeply in understanding and then addressing the social determinants of health, and that yes, that there are funding model questions to be sorted out uh, there, but this recognition is very different now than it was you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And this creates a real opportunity for us. You know, if we can pull uh, healthcare players together, uh, along with education players, but including insurers who you know, could be funding sources, to, together to realize, look, if we invest upstream in addressing trauma, we will decrease our healthcare costs significantly mm -hmm. down the line. This could ultimately result in cost savings for payers as well, as well as for health systems. Then suddenly you start to align financial incentives with the health outcomes that we all care about. But you know, the, the p question people ask me all the time is, well, of course it makes sense that if an insurance company focuses on prevention that they'll save money down the line. So why, why haven't they done it yet? There must be something else like bigger at play. But you know, sometimes it, there aren't much bigger complex issues at play. Sometimes these issues are about, is somebody gonna stand up and lead uh, the conversation and be the first mover? Um, sometimes there's risk in doing that, which is why you have to get people together to say, we're all gonna do this together and take on the risk collectively, because then each of us will bear less risk overall. And sometimes if an industry is not willing to do that, they need to be pressured and pushed from the outside in the way that sometimes insurers and payers can be pushed by the clinical settings that, that they help fund and by the patients uh, that they help serve as well. So I say this just to, to, to emphasize that while the federal government is an extraordinarily powerful and important lever that we can use uh, to address childhood trauma, it is not the only one. Uh, and I wouldn't want us to, uh, to be despondent when efforts to move the federal government fail uh, because there are other levers we can, can and should be working on as well. Great, thank you. Hearing none, I'm going to keep going. Um, so we're going to pivot off the government aspect of uh, how we address this and go to community support. You know, I am a firm believer and I agree with our former um, First Lady Barbara Bush when she said that 
the future of this country is not dependent on what happens in the White House, but what happens in every home. And resilient families, our communities, we have a responsibility to help the families, the family unit, to be resilient and be stronger. In your mind, what does, if not government, what does broad community support look like in fostering and helping families and children be resilient? What does that look like? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, I don't 100% know the answer to that. I do know some of the answers to that in the sense that I know what it could look like, but I suspect it would look a bit different uh, in different communities. Uh, but I'll tell you why, why this sort of strikes me uh, so deeply, because when I was, when I started my tenure uh, as Surgeon General, I spent the first many months uh, traveling to different parts of the country as part of a listening tour, to under, asking a very simple question to communities, which is, how can I help? And I certainly had an agenda that I had talked about in my Senate confirmation hearing that I wanted to implement, but some a voice in the back of my head just said, let's put that on hold for a moment and let's just see if everyone agrees with this agenda or let's just see what they have in mind because maybe they'll be aligned, but maybe they won't. Maybe there are deeper problems that people are dealing with that uh, should be uh, high up on my agenda and aren't. And I heard a lot of stories about mental illness. I heard stories about chronic illness, uh, chronic physical illness that people were, were dealing with. I heard many stories about the opiate epidemic. Uh, I heard about, I've heard from teachers in schools who told me that their kids couldn't smoke cigarettes, obviously, in class and couldn't chew gum in the classroom, but they were vaping. They were using e-cigarettes because there were no rules around them. I heard all of these stories, which were very, very powerful. But when I think, of, when I sort of reflected back on many of the families that I sat with, what I heard in their stories uh, at a deeper level were stories of emotional pain. And the question that I couldn't shake was what's driving that emotional pain? And what is happening to us as a result of that emotional pain? That pain is the trauma, in a sense, that all of us have been talking about this morning that so many of us have been worried about for years. Mm -hmm. And one of the big challenges that I noticed uh, communities have is in having a language to talk about that pain and in having permission to surface it in discussion. Because there was nobody who came up to me of all the thousands of people that I met all across America in small fishing villages in Alaska or small towns in the Midwest or big cities on the coast. Not a single person who came up to me and said, hi, my name is Jane Doe. I'm in emotional pain. Nobody said that. But it was so clear, like in their stories, and when I started surfacing it myself a few months in and asking about it, there was this visceral reaction from people, this immediate flicker of recognition that yes, that is what I'm feeling, like inside, or someone I love is feeling that. And I don't know how to give words to it, I don't know how to address it, but I know it's there. And it's been there for a while. And so part of, I think, the part of what we have to do as a community is we have to start by making it okay for people to talk about it, to delve more deeply into this emotional pain. You know, I think about the many patients I cared for uh, as an internist, you know, and I'm sad to say that in the beginning of my medical career, I didn't ask that much about emotional pain because I wasn't taught that in medical mm -hmm. school, no. right? I was taught uh, to ask a whole bunch of other questions. Uh, and, but, you know, emotional pain was really kind of low on the list. Uh, so, that, I think, is one of the most powerful things communities can do, is to think how, in my school, in my workplace, in my family, can I start to talk about emotions, talk about the pain that we may be experiencing, talk about the trauma that may be affecting all of us? Because as we've discussed earlier today, that the trauma that we're concerned about is, is really two types of trauma, right? It's a trauma of, you know, that occurs when something happens to you whether that's an episode of abuse or neglect or whether that's you living uh, in a family, a situation that's unstable. But there's also the collective trauma that we experience. Every time there's a mass shooting uh, in our country, millions of people around the country who live thousands of miles away are traumatized by that again and again. Every time uh, a person of color is, uh, has their life uh, taken from them by someone in law enforcement. That sends ripples all across the country uh, from parents who are worried to death about their children and from 
young men and women who wonder if they're going to make it to their 18th or 25th birthday. Um, I want to say that with the mass shootings, while we focus so much on that, I think there's far greater trauma that happens in our communities as a result of the smaller scale shootings that don't make the papers. Mm -hmm. Ones that not only traumatize individuals, but uh, that lead children to lose mothers and fathers and siblings, uh, and that lead people in their neighborhood to wonder if it's safe to walk down the street. If we want to take ownership of our well-being as a community, it starts with acknowledging what's happening to us, with make, creating a space for people to actually talk about that without judgment. And I say this particularly for men, because I think that we live in a society with a brand of masculinity that tells us it's not okay for guys to talk about emotions, much less experience them. We tell young boys that they have to be self-sufficient and that being dependent on anyone is a, you know, is a sign of weakness or not being a real man. Uh, that's really crippling to young men. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when young boys shift how they talk about, relation, how they talk about relationships from talking about loving their friends and being very open with their emotions to when they're in early adolescence being very stoic, that that coincides with a dramatic increase in the self-harm and suicide rate among young boys. So this is a place where all we don't need federal action or government action of any sort. Uh, this is a place where we as individuals can begin these conversations and we can lead by example. Uh, as people told me before I had uh, children, they said, your kids won't listen to what you say, they'll listen to what you do. And when we model behavior uh, that shows children, our children that it's okay to acknowledge uh, and talk about what's happening to us on an emotional level, there's a greater likelihood that they will follow through and do the same. Great, thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm short. Um, don't be sorry. Don't apologize. <laughs> um, it's really good to, to hear all this conversation and I'm really glad that you brought up the issue of um, kind of the collective pain that you were, that you were identifying and especially in connection with then all of the data that has come out about the so-called disease of despair um, that hit the radar once there was a certain class of people who were articulating or we were seeing the results of that collective pain, right? Um, so in the context of a lot of this being rooted in the, uh, you know, community, I, there was a slide earlier this morning about like the, the community trauma, um, at, which is in itself also rooted in decades and decades and generations of privileging some communities with resources and assets, um, and then using other communities, um, you know, over, overwhelming them with risks and lack of resources. It's hard to imagine how community by community, especially in those that have been, not to get into a deficit framework, but those that have been clearly under-resourced over time, how do we get the resources into those communities other than through some sort of federal framework, right? Um, so having been in that federal space, what do you think would be the most effective ways to get to some of those, um, that redistribution of risk and resources and health that has to happen um, if we really do want to get to a place um, where we achieve health equity? Well, I mean, this is, it's such an important question and a, it's a tough one, right? Because money is, always feels like it's scarce and the people who often have power don't want to often divert money from the places that it's traditionally been going. So, so this is hard, but I think when I talked earlier about the importance of building power and advocacy and bringing communities together that are understand where we need to focus our efforts and are willing to push their elected leaders to do so, that's building political power, mm -hmm. right? And uh, political power doesn't have to be partisan power, but it has to be power that we choose to amass for the purposes of achieving a goal. And I think equity has to be at the, at the top of the list in terms of that goal. Like, look, this is a, a fundamental, this moment in our country is one where we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question of values, which is what values are going to guide us in our policies, in the movements that we build, in the programs that we support and run, in the institutions that we manage. What values are going to guide us? And what I worry about, whenever somebody tells me, 
you know, I voted for, you know, John Doe for, uh, for mayor. I don't really agree with John's, like, you know, philosophy. I don't really like John. I don't think John shares my values. But, you know, John is going to pass policy X, which I like. And it's going to help me, so I'm going to vote for John. That always sends chills down my spine. Because we don't know 99% of the decisions that our leaders make. Because we can't keep track of all of that. You have to trust in the values of that person, in their perspective. And so to me, equity has to be a priority, but will only be a priority reflected in our policies and in our government if we as voters demand that of the people that we put into office at every level, at local, state, and federal levels. Look, on a, on a deeper level, I think the, the question of values to me boils down to the fundamental question of do we want to live in a nation that is governed by fear or in a nation that is inspired by love? It's a somewhat binary choice, but it is the choice, right? When we are living from a place of fear, we see a lot of what we see today. We see people acting out of anxiety. We see a lot of anger. We see insecurity, uh, and we see out-and-out out fear. When we are acting from a place of love, as all of us have experienced at some point in our lives, that's a place of generosity, of compassion, of inspiration, of kindness. Those are the things that flow from love. And right now, our world is locked in a struggle between love and fear. And the question is, what's going to tip it one way or the other? One thing I do know is that when children live parts of their life in deep fear, for long periods of time, that is deeply traumatic. And one of the most powerful antidotes to trauma is, in fact, love. It is the love that you get from your parents, from your teacher, from friends. It's knowing that you matter, and it's knowing that you belong. Such powerful things that we can provide to children and that we can provide to ourselves. Because the truth is, the trauma that we're talking about today is not just affecting kids. It's affecting adults. How is a child supposed to heal if their parents themselves are deeply traumatized and their teachers are too? Uh, we are all living the result of trauma that we have not acknowledged and that we have often underestimated. And so this, to me, this boils down to a fundamental question of values, but a question also of do we want to live in a nation of love or fear? My wife and I thought deeply about this uh, a few years ago when we found out we were pregnant for the first time. We have a 22-month-old at home and a 5-month-old at home. Uh, and um, when our 22-month-old, when we were pregnant with him, you know, we were so excited. We were just absolutely thrilled. Um, we had been wanting to have uh, children. We were so excited to be parents. Um, and we sat down, though, after looking at that pregnancy test and seeing that it was positive and just hugging each other and just have, you know, just crying over uh, it and just being so thrilled. We sat down and we, it started to sink in and, and we started thinking about what was happening in the world. We started thinking about the fact that young men had lost their lives in communities uh, as a result, you know, of violence. We started thinking about the fact that young women uh, were the result, uh, were, the, were the victims, you know, of uh, sexual assault all over our country and on college campuses. And we started to think about our child and what kind of world we were bringing him into. Uh, would he be safe when he went to school? Uh, would he be supported by people in his neighborhoods? Would he live in a world that was powered by love or one that was constrained by fear? That's what we thought about in that time. And we knew as two people we couldn't solve that entire problem. But what we knew then and what I know now is that each of us in our own way can put our finger on that scale and can tip that balance more toward love in the work, in the interactions we have with the people around us, in the causes we choose to focus on, on the matters in which we choose to speak up about. You know, if, if it turns out that speaking up on the behalf of children and the people you love makes people label you as controversial and political, then you should do it anyway. Because it's worth doing, it's what matters. Uh, and we need more people in our country who are standing up for what matters, for, the, for our values as opposed to specific policies and positions. And finally on this, just remember this. What you read in the newspaper is not a true indicator of where the country is in terms of how people feel. If you read the papers, you would assume everyone in this country is cynical. They don't want to be involved you know, in any causes. They're just focused on themselves. Everyone has turned inward. 
that is not the case. All of you are living proof of that. But I want to tell you that you are not the minority. Because when I reflect on the people I met over the last few years when I, during my time in office, I met people who were scared, they were worried, they were feeling cynical, but underneath that was idealism and a desire to feel hopeful. Underneath that was a desire to want to be a part of making their community better. And each time one of you stands up to speak up on behalf of children, each time you stand up and push your government to do the right thing for our kids, the ripple effects are extraordinary. You inspire people around you. You let them know that it is possible to stand in strength, even in the face of great adversity. So that's why I'm so grateful that all of you are taking this uh, up upon, you know, they're taking this issue on, that even in tough times that you're not backing down. But I want you to know that you give strength to others when you speak up and when you do the work that you have been doing. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Great. Did you have comments there? <laughs> Maybe one last comment or question? Because I, can... okay. oh, I am also short. Um, Thank you so much for everything that you've said and particularly what you've said in the past couple of minutes. It's very moving. And um, just to lift up some of what you've been talking about, I do think that in this conversation about trauma, we do have to figure out how do we language this in a way that makes sense to people. Mm -hmm. And you named emotional pain as something that everybody feels. I feel like when we expand our lens, not just about trauma, but also about stress, I feel like that word really, people can really relate yeah. to stress. That, it, that kind of language allows us um, to move towards um, what Gregory Boyles talks about as radical kinship, right? where we stand with people in the margins, not because we're trying to make a difference, but because they make us different. And when we have that sort of proximity, it allows us to lead from a place of love as opposed to a place of fear, which is so important because what we know is that fear and stress actually exacerbate things like implicit bias and stereotype thinking. So really coming at this from, from both ends becomes really important. And the last thing I just want to lift up is the psychological safety. Even Google's talking about this now, right? That psychological safety, the ability to know that I might make a mistake, and if I take a healthy risk and make a mistake, I'm not going to be crucified for it, ends up being how we help you have more productive and healthy um, people in companies and citizens and communities. So um, I think t trauma fragments, and there's all these different ways of talking about this, but the more we can bring that language together, as you've talked about, um, I think that we'll be able to make a difference. But thank you so much for everything you said. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, I also want to thank you because you brought the lens, at least for my learning today, of as I think about policies, procedures, tactics, strategies for KP Northwest, is this trauma reducing or trauma inducing? That lens is very helpful. So, so thank you for today. Yeah. Yeah. What you said was so beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that. I felt sort of a little shiver when you, when you, when you shared those words. Um, Look, you're you're absolutely right that um, language is really important, and one of the things that we're also fighting against is fragmentation. It feels like there are so many causes out there. How, like, which one do you support? How do you get the attention of the public? People are hearing about climate change. They're hearing about health. You know, people being uninsured with health. They're hearing about all kinds of crises. I think that there is a larger umbrella, though that we can think about childhood trauma under, and that's under the umbrella of emotional well-being. And with the counterpoint of emotional well-being being pain and stress and, and trauma. And when, when I came out of office, I, having worked on a number of issues, but including opioids in particular and addiction more broadly, I was thinking about what, what, what should I do now if I want to make a contribution to the world? Where, where can I help? And what I concluded was that as opposed to focusing specifically just on opioids or just on uh, gun violence or just on uh, e-cigarette use, that the place that I want to focus was on the deeper root cause of emotional well-being for children and adults, for all of us. And it turns out that if we are thoughtful about this and skilled in how we communicate about this, we can help people see that emotional well-being is connected to all the other big issues we care about. That emotional pain that I was seeing everywhere as we all know, 
translates in part to a greater experience of physical pain. Mm -hmm. And when we are struggling to figure out how to deal with people who, are, who have chronic pain, who are using opioids, uh, it seems so obvious now that we should not just be looking for a location of physical injury, but we should be looking more deeper uh, for a source of injury. But I think that this umbrella of emotional well-being is, is really important. It's an issue I've decided to focus my time and attention on. It's why uh, my colleague Jessica and some of us have decided to work on building an institute to lift the profile of emotional well-being, to build public support for it, to lay out an agenda from a policy and scientific perspective so that we, and to try to build action collaboratives to execute these agendas so we can make emotional well-being the foundation you know, of our society, not just an afterthought. But I think that is, language and creating those umbrellas are really, really important. And I think the language that you just used now was very moving, and I think it would speak to uh, a lot of people. So I applaud you for focusing on that. Um, but I, I want to say that the most important ingredient that we need to build a movement to improve the emotional health of our children and adults to reduce trauma is we need passionate people like you. Uh, you know, when you think about how big movements are built, the most important ingredient in building movements is not money uh, and it's not infrastructure. Those are really, really important. But it's the people, and it's often a small group of people who get together and to decide, you know what, we can live a better way and we are going to ensure that we live a better way. Uh, and we are going to be the ones who build that movement, whether we affect 10 people or 10 million people. And so I know it can be, I've worked on building organizations before. I know it can be a lonely journey. It can be a tough experience. Um, but I do want you to know that when I come here, and I was sitting in the back some time ago listening to uh, the panel earlier and hearing the questions that were asked, I want you to know that I draw hope from you as well. And it gives me encouragement and inspires me to know that of all the things that you could be doing, and probably making more money doing some of those things, that you have chosen to focus on kids, to focus on reducing trauma, because you recognize that at some point our values have to matter more. And if we truly are a society that values all life, where every person has worth, then we have to act that way. We have to reach out to those who are less fortunate than us. We have to help that child feel that just because their mother is in prison or because their father uh, is using heroin does not mean that they are fundamentally broken as well. We have to help them understand that just because they may not find love at home does not mean that they are not worthy of love. And so that is the inspiration that you have provided me. But there are many more people who will be inspired by the movement that you are building. But let's, yeah, let's focus on that language. Let's build that broader tent, an umbrella that can bring people in. And then let's help the country see the connections between our emotional well-being and all these outcomes that we care about, that we read about in the papers. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you all.